we get into cell replication, which I, <laughs> which I'm sure you know most of you will agree, there's a lot going on here. So I'm going to break down, break this down, and the inquiry question here is how important is it for genetic material to be replicated exactly? Um, it's a bit of a study tip, but once you sort of go through the modules, you should be able to come back and answer this inquiry question in like like a solid extended response using all the information that's listed underneath that dot point. So it's all about being able to come back and, you know, say, all right, I've learned these, these, these concepts. And this is how it's relevant to, you know, this question of how important it is for genetic material to be replicated exactly. So all of these processes then are doing this to ensure that, you know, genetic material is replicated exactly. So there's a lot going on here, but think of those concepts and think they all need to come back and link to this big question that you should be able to answer in like, like I said, an extended response, you know, a 9, 10 marker, a solid response. Okay, so cell replication meiosis. So I'm getting straight into meiosis today, but um, as we know, there's mitosis and meiosis because we're looking at cell replication and genetic material being transferred. We're looking specifically at meiosis. So key structures that we want to look at, chromosomes, nuclear envelopes, um, a mitotic spindle and the cell membrane. So as you can see here, we've got the homologous chromosomes. This, this middle part here is the centromere. So the chromosomes are counted by the centromere here. So this is one chromosome and this is one chromosome, but this is also one chromosome because there's that one centromere there. So... Okay, so like we, like I said, so we've got that one chromosome here and another one here. It's a homologous pair of chromosomes. And then we are replicating it. So just here, we're getting a copy of that chromosome. And same thing happens here. So these two are called sister chromatids, and they're both homologous chromosomes. So here we need to know rounds of division, how many rounds of division are happening in meiosis, that's two. Um, the number of daughter cells that you get, that's four. So you end up with four daughter cells in meiosis, but in mitosis you end up with two. Um, the chromosome number of daughter cells, there's it's a uh, haploid number, so it's going to be 23. And then the role in the body, why is it important? And that's what we're going to go through now. So got two diagrams here and I'm going to simplify this for us but we need to remember that meiosis is happening here we've got meiosis one and meiosis two so well I mean <laughs> generally all the fun stuff happens in meiosis one you know all the crossing over and stuff but you need to remember both of them and you need to remember the process and the names um so prophase one so we start off with our interface prophase one metaphase anaphase t uh, telophase and cytokinesis and then we've got the same thing happening here so what happens specifically we start off with our centrosomes here our chromosomes are lined up over here then that dna is copied it's replicated right and then those chromosomes are that sorry then those chromosomes are going to pair up that's prophase one so interface um you know, we're getting ready for our DNA replication. The DNA is replicated. So we've got prophase. Um, as you can see, the chromosomes pair up. Then recombination occurs. So actually, when our chromosomes pair up, sorry, and then recombination occurs, here we've got metaphase. But there's also prometaphase. So something to know, but, you know, we can't go from prophase to metaphase. Again, sorry about that. Um, but like I said, I'm going to speak a bit louder so hopefully you're able to hear me okay. So we've got chromosomes that line up at the equator. Sorry, give me one second. Okay. Alright, so we've got chromosome, chromosomes that line up at the equator here. And we've got the mitotic spindle there. And then we see crossing over. So it happens over here. And then chromosomes are pulled apart. So pulled apart. So over here, you can see now crossing over has occurred. The genetic material has been exchanged. When they're crossing over, it's going to be the same. The um, When they line up, it's sort of the same traits. They are going to cross over, but the genetic material there is going to be for the same trait. So, for instance, hair color. So, you know, one chromosome may have... Um, copy for let's say black hair color and one might have for brown and then they're going to cross over and then the black is going to be here and the brown is going to be here if that makes sense so it's crossing over and they're exchanging that genetic material for that specific trait so then the chromosomes are pulled apart in anaphase one so they're lining up and then we pull them apart in anaphase one 
Then we see telophase one and cytokinesis. So now the cell is pinching them apart in the middle and we end up with our two daughter cells. So cytokinesis technically isn't, um, we're not look well, it's sort of taught differently, um, I guess, but you know, we're not looking specifically at cytokinesis, but you need to know cytokinesis is when they're pulled apart, they're forming their um, nuclear membrane around around the cells and it's done, right? So that's when we've got our two separate cells. So that's cytokinesis. But in the um <clears throat> in like the formula that you would have learned for it, for example, um, or you know, generally you don't really consider cytokinesis, it's but it is happening there to then pinch the cells apart and make them um, their own little cells so that you know it's ready then for the next part of it then individually we see prophase 2 in the two daughter cells you can still see that it's crossed over now so that occurs here that is contributing to biodiversity when those genetic traits are being um, exchanged so that's something that we'll come back to too again in module 6 so we've got prophase 2 happening here where we've got our two daughter cells um, from there, we've got metaphase 2, where these chromosomes line up at the equator. Like I said earlier, the um, crossing over and the recombination occurs here in prophase and metaphase. It's not happening again in pro, uh, in meiosis 2. It's already happened here. Now we've got the two daughter cells, metaphase 2 again. The metaphase 2 again, they're lining up. They line up at that equator, and we've got the mitotic spindles that are holding on to them. In anaphase 2, the sister chromatids are pulled apart. So... In telophase 2, what ends up is now the cell pinches them apart. And finally, after cytokinesis is done, we end up with four granddaughter cells over here. You can see they're all different. They're not going to be similar. Again, that's biodiversity. So we've got four daughter cells ready to go. Haplo four haplodaughter cells ready to go. So they're, they're going to have 23 chromosomes. Now, what is the role in the... Well, actually, before we go on to the role in the body, let's specifically now look at cell replication when we see the DNA being copied here in interface, right? So what's happening here? So let's start off with our DNA structure. So we've got the nucleotides, so that's phosphate plus the dioxyribose sugar over here. So this is one nucleotide. So you see the um, you see the sugar, the phosphate, and then we've got the nitrogenous base, which is a C here, cytosine. Um, it's double-stranded, right? So it's got a double-stranded stra helical structure, alpha helix, and complementary base pairing. So that's char gaps rule, which means that the number of A nucleotides, so the number of adenosine, will equal the number of thymine, and the number of um, guanine will equal the number of cytosine. So they're going to be equal, they're going to be complementary, and that's called char gaps rule, but that's just what it is. You know, it's going to be equal. So we've got a sugar phosphate bas uh, su sorry, a sugar phosph phosphate backbone, and we've got a nucleotide here, and it's in a helical structure. It's being wrapped up. Why? Because it's long, the DNA is long, so it's wrapped up in those chromosomes, and that's where our genetic information lies. So, how is DNA replication occurring? I'm going to give you a rundown of it. So, we start off with initi uh, initiation, where the DNA is unzipped by helicase. It's unzipped by the enzyme helicase. Um, re remember, when D so when we've got DNA um, replication occurring, enzymes play a very important role in it. So you'll come across a range of different enzymes. Um, and we start off with helicase, which is one of the big ones because it's unzipping the DNA. Then we've got elongation. So primers bind to the end of the DNA strand. So we've got a replication pole here. So that's where it's starting. Remember, there's a three prime end and a five prime end as well. And we've got a replication that starts from the five prime end. Um, so it's going straight down, but from the three prime and the replication is going to start over here at the end and go up. So over here, replication starts at the beginning. Hopefully you're able to see my, the way to, let me see if I can, no, okay. I was trying to get that laser thingy, but I think, I don't know. I've only done that on Google slides so far. So, but hopefully you're able to see my mouse here. So with five prime end, you see DNA replication happening here from the start. But with the three prime end, this is the three prime end, the replication starts here, kind of at the replication fork, and it's moving backwards. So we've got DNA polymerase over here. So primers bind to the end of the DNA strands. DNA polymerase binds at the primer site. And that's 
And from now, DNA polymerase is reading the strand and attaching that complementary free floating nucleotide um, onto a nucleotide in order to get the complementary DNA. So termination. Termination is our last process where the polymerase reaches the end of the molecule and it falls off. So we've got a DNA polymerase, it's done its job, it reaches the end of the molecule and, it's, and it falls off. Um, the strands recoil into a double helix. Why? Because the DNA is long, it needs, to, it's, think of it as, you know, a surface area thing. It's wrapped up, right? So it's wrapped up, it's coiled, it's tightly coiled in order to be small. Um, and then we see proofreading occur by the nuclease enzymes. So it's a crash course of this little, um, pro not this little, this huge process. Um, it's a little crash course, but what it's telling you basically is from here on the chromosome. Now remember, when DNA replication occurs, um, when it occurs specifically when we later on look at, um, you know, like protein synthesis and stuff, not the whole thing is being replicated right now for several for cell replication it is, but later on it won't be the whole thing that's being replicated. It's only part of the DNA that we need. So don't worry about that just yet. I'll talk about it again. But what I'm trying to tell you is it opens up, it unwraps, and we are replicating a specific part. And remember, there's a five prime strand and a three prime strand. The five prime strand is called the leading strand. And so as so DNA polymerase is going to start attaching nucleotides from here from the beginning. But with the lagging strand the three prime st strand it's happening here from the back where it starts off at the back and it's going forward and here it, they're just happening in opposite directions that's what you need to know okay